Oh dear, these are Rocky kids. This is American stuff, it's new to you. Are getting their first exposure to the Western world. This is a new And it goes way beyond playing with a real fire truck. So this is it then, is what you're saying. Yes. Locked away in a State Department closet here in Babel Province oh, are four laptop computers designed just for kids. <laughs> and everybody wants one. So I said, I'll go get you one. The idea here is one laptop per child. When did we make the order? Around 2008? At least two years ago, the order went out for 8,000 of these laptops for 400 schools in Babel Province. Uh -huh. <laughs> the hardware is kid-proof and cheap to construct. The software, including video chat, is free and open source, making each laptop affordable to hand out in the developing world. Yeah, I think it's about a little less than 300 dollars per computer. The State Department paid $275 per laptop. But right now, all 8,000 are sitting in a cargo container down at the port of Basra, locked up and switched off. It's, it's a logistical problem after that. Iraq is home to 31 million. More than a third of them are 14 years old or younger, and very few have access to computers, let alone the Internet. We're starting them with 8,000 computers, which is a lot of computers, but not enough still, sadly. But soon, these kids will enter a larger world of instant information. All they got today was the fire truck. Say goodbye, thank you. Shukran. Hi, Shukran. Okay, Shukran. High tech okay. tools in a country that's still surrounded by these giant blast walls everywhere because of the security situation. When we come back, personal stories. One from an American soldier who's here missing his family back in California, and another from an Iraqi police chief who's about to lose two vital tools any cop needs. Both of these men are here in this country fighting terrorism. Assignment Iraq continues on the other side of the break. Welcome back to the land of the date palm, Baghdad, Iraq. My name is Dave Malkoff, spending 30 days here in this country. As you know, the United States has a vested interest in what happens in Iraq. The theory goes like this. You've heard it before. If democracy works here in Iraq, it may spread throughout the Middle East. Now, what I've learned here is that is the oversimplification of the century. This region is, in a word, complicated. There's so many moving parts here, and the American military in Iraq is just one piece of that huge machine. Here's one soldier's story. As the Iraqi army vehicles starting to queue up. Basra is right here between Iraq and another hard place, Iran. We're about 15 miles from the border. Showing up in MRAPs, in Humvees. It looks aggressive. This is an MRAP. Uh, it's a, a bigger version of the Humvee, basically. It's a better armor. It's the only way U.S. officials can roll through these rough streets with some level of security. Basically, bodyguards. Army Staff Sergeant Jason Grant is on his fourth tour. It's always dangerous, but. It's gotten a lot better. Grant's team and my body armor make it possible to leave the base today. Oh, there's not that many uh, California folks out here. Just a couple of L.A. guys out for a drive. Oh, Sloss and Alviso by Sloss and Crenshaw. Grant's been in some bad situations here in Basra. But back in L.A., his dad is fighting in a hospital bed. It's cancer, and it's bad. He, he's good spirits, but he's not doing too well. Even if he wanted to get home in a hurry, he couldn't. This place is extremely hard to get to and just as hard to get back. But you know what? There's got to be a TV in that hospital room, right? I just want to tell him I love him, hang in there, and uh, as soon as I'm able to come home, I'll be home to help you out and uh, to get you through this. Can I say one more one thing? Oh, yeah. no, no, absolutely. Uh, I do want to just uh, say hello to my wife and uh, my son and my daughter. Uh, she's two months old, Ariana, my son, Dayton, and my wife, uh, Lindsay. I love you guys, and I miss you very much. OK, it's about 9 PM here in Babel Province. I'm learning this happens uh, more often than you'd like. Uh, I just heard four explosions, and uh, and sheltering in place just like they'd, they'd like you to do and you either run to a bunker or you shelter in place you're supposed to get down on the floor i feel a little silly i feel like that um that world war ii duck and cover turtle um but this is the reality here on the ground 
There's nothing I can do, so I figured I'd explain it to you on this little uh, still camera here. What I did not know at the time is how serious that attack actually was. As I was recording that video, medics were responding to an area where a U.S. soldier had just been killed. That nighttime attack in Babel Province took the life of U.S. Army Specialist Faith Hinckley from Colorado Springs, this high school cheerleader who surprised her family by signing up for the Army back in 2007, was killed less than 400 feet from my bunk. Faith's family and friends quickly set up a memorial page on Facebook. The newspaper back home interviewed her grandmother, who remembered her granddaughter as a sweet and gentle girl. Now, she was just 23 years old. Many of her fellow soldiers here on the base were literally packing their bags to leave, to go home. Max flew her to Baghdad, where she died that Saturday night. Now, two other soldiers were also around Faith at the time. They were hurt as well. Now, even though I do know the general location where that rocket hit, I can't, and more precisely, I won't tell you where that hit, because that's the information that will help insurgents target. What I can show you is this. This is a concrete and sandbag bunker. This is, if you aren't in your civilian housing unit, where you should shelter in place. And this is where a lot of people did shelter in place for about an hour before that all clear was notified. Now, as for the investigation, the Iraqis are taking the lead on this investigation as they normally do with the Americans helping them out. What they're looking for is possibly, possibly a 107 millimeter rocket. Let me show you a picture of one of these 107 millimeter rockets. This is launched from a metal launching platform. So what they'll have is some fingerprint evidence possibly on that 107 millimeter launching platform and possibly some rockets that failed to launch. So they'll take all this physical evidence and put it into a national database. All this national database information will be available so if anybody gets picked up anywhere in Iraq, they can link them back to this. And that wasn't even the first time we were attacked during my month in Iraq. It happened over and over again, like this time at Talil Air Base. It's still dangerous. People are still dying, even though the American military is drawing down. Join the discussion. Let us know what you think about the war, America's involvement in the Middle East, and the future for the people of Iraq. Photos, behind-the-scenes details, and links are posted at ktla.com slash Dave. Post your comments after the show. Assignment Iraq continues after this short break. Good evening from Camp Stryker in Baghdad. Let me explain why we're here. I've been selected by the State Department to come here and teach journalism classes to local Iraqi journalists. While I'm here, I have the opportunity to report on this huge story. For seven years, the American military has been here in Iraq. Now the drawdown is beginning and the civilian end is ramping up the State Department is helping the Iraqis stand on their own two feet. That's a huge story, and we're here to cover it. But how did we get here? It was a long journey. This journey started Friday, wheels up from Washington, Dulles. But as a civilian guest of the State Department, I cannot fly directly into Baghdad. I have to fly across Iraq into Kuwait. At this point, I've been traveling for about 18, 19 hours here in Kuwait City. It's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. But we're nowhere near our destination. We're on our way to the base, and then it's on to Baghdad once we get a mill air flight out. Ali Al Salim Air Base is where I stay overnight in a tent. My passport, however, goes all the way back to Kuwait City for the visa. In the morning, we reunite with seconds to spare, and it's go time. We're aboard a U.S. Embassy run C-130 with room for 60, including State Department Public Diplomacy Officer Cynthia Hogel. We're going the same place. Baghdad. I wanted to bring a U.S. journalist to teach the Iraqis what it is to work in an open and free media, something they're just beginning to have the opportunity to do. We met with dozens and dozens of Iraqi reporters all over the southern end of the country. 
First in Basra, where I taught a few hours in the classroom, then we actually went out and shot a story together. The Iraqis are truly hungry for this kind of training and information after going decades without access to modern tools of the trade. There was also a large class in Dikar province where the reporters actually interviewed me for the local news. Then there was a three-hour convoy to Mathana province in a Humvee where I taught a class to the local journalist and another to a group of youth parliament members. These are students who want to work in the new Iraqi government someday. We also brought some modern-day storytelling techniques to Babel province. This class was actually at the site of the Babel ruins. There's a conference center there. Baghdad was our last stop for these classes. Here, the journalists asked me not to show their faces on TV, so I've blurred them out here. They face the most risk of any reporter in Iraq. While I was in Iraq, a suicide bomber drove into the Al Arabiya Network television building, and blew his car bomb up, killing a few employees and injuring 16 others. Now, despite this risk, they all still come to work and report the news every day. Now, they have whole television stations to transmit their stories to the people in Iraq. I'm thousands of miles from home, so how do we get the stories back to you live from Iraq? Live, I'm Dave Malkoff on assignment Iraq. Michael, back to you. All right. Well, that story starts back in Hollywood. What I'm wearing on my back is basically a satellite truck like this one over here, but it's paired down in today's 21st century technology we have everything that this sat truck has on my back this is the heart of the system the intersat began by hughes this is basically my satellite antenna i'm pointing up to a geosynchronous satellite that is just about where phil the photographer is standing i'm going to turn it on right here that's actually a really good signal that i just got right there and uh, that would be good to go for our first test you know i've been fascinated by this stuff my whole life. I've always wanted to do this kind of foreign correspondence stuff. One of the most important things for any democracy is a free press. It's an honor for me to go over there and talk to these journalists and teach them and, uh, and also learn from them. We've been in this war for seven years. What happens yeah. next? This is how we roll in Baghdad in a U.S. Army striker. But more and more, the fight against terrorism isn't in vehicles like this, but normal police cruisers. These feet march on the front lines against terrorism every day. Ten years ago, Colonel Thamar Sadun Ali was tracking armed smugglers when the bad guys opened fire and he was hit several times in the leg. And that's been the, the bones were almost destroyed. It almost looks like it's breadcrumbs. Almost looks like breadcrumbs inside the x-ray. It's just getting worse. Now he's in a race against time to fix the leg. If I take off for a few months, terrorism will advance, especially in my sector. That's where LAP PD comes in. My name is Richard Davis, and I spent uh, just a little over 26 years there. The reverse time has started for my uh, treatment. He is would be the equivalent on our department in Los Angeles of a deputy chief. Iraqi doctors don't have the technology to fix the chief's leg, but Indian doctors have offered to do it for free. Just getting them to India is the problem. Uh, because incidentals aren't paid for. I mean, who's going who's to cover that cost? Police or police, doesn't really matter where they are. LAPD is now asking for donations from people like you back in L.A. And I know they may be asking, well, why this person over someone else? And my view is, well, why not? He's been one of the key players in this at great personal risk to himself. And I think in the long run, it gives meaning to the sacrifices that our troops have made here. This one man has influence over a large portion of Baghdad province. Keeping him on patrol and helping stabilize this community could cost as little as $15,000. When that day comes, I'll come back as a tourist. Doc will come with me and we'll all go for a jog and around the block. Iraq is a country that is constantly changing. If we told this story a month ago or told it a month from now, we'd be telling a very different story. But the future is up to the people of Iraq and how they decide to go forward with their country. That is a story that is yet to be told. From Baghdad, I'm Dave Malkoff. Good night.